hopefully he's there. Hi, Michael. Hello. How are you? How are you? Very I know good. you're a very busy man, so thank you for joining us. Uh, the GRC Lunch Club, your end, the GRC Supper Club, our side. I I've been saying for about 15 years that I don't understand the disconnect between business continuity and operational risk management. It just by you know, has boggled me because there's so much synergy and things that they can leverage from each other that they should be integrated. But, you know, today's organization is what I call navigating chaos. In fact, I wrote a paper on this uh, that was published in October in Enterprise Risk Magazine by the Institute of Risk Management over there in London. And, you know, that today's organization is dynamic. It's changing minute by minute, second by second. Employees are changing, economics are changing, business processes are changing, technology is changing. You know, we have things coming at us from every direction. Uh, and, and today's business is definitely chaos. And we have to be able to see the interrelationships of all these different types of risk. In fact, you know, the physicist Friedrich Kopra stated, the more we study the major problems of our time, the more we come to realize that they cannot be understood in isolation. They are systemic problems, which means that they're interconnected and interdependent. The physicist here is talking about biological ecosystems, but it applies so well to business and risk management today that our problems, our risks, are interconnected and interdependent. We need to be able to see all these different strands and threads of risk and how they relate to each other. Look at COVID-19, for example. You know, the current pandemic, you know, it, it, the core event is a health and safety risk, you know, uh, and, and so we, we have a, a, a global um, virus pandemic that, that started off in Asia, you know, so, you know, potentially from, you know, a wet market with, with, with bats, you know, and, but, you know, that little event has this cascading impact. It reminds me of chaos theory, you know, with a the theory of the flutter of a butterfly's wings in the Netherlands, in the, in the Netherlands can influence the development path of a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, right now we've got a worldwide crisis and everything being shut down um, with something starting to finally come into re recovery. Um, all because of a wet market in China, potentially. You know, and so it starts off with the health and safety risk, but then we have a significant economic risk from that and risk exposure. Well, we, we've got uh, IT security risks because people are working from home in remote offices, and all of a sudden the, the blender in that remote office could be a, a, a doorway in and threat to that remote office, home office worker. Now, I'm, I'm serious, my, my wife and I upgraded our blender at the Wisconsin State Fair in August. My blender is connected. I can program it with my iPhone. My TVs are connected. My wall outlets are connected. You know, if there's some type of security vulnerability and exposure in my home office, it could, in my home, it could expose the, my computer and the data connections and data I have with that computer. You know, we have IT security risks. You know, with, with the COVID-19, you know, it, not only is it a health and safety risk, as I illustrated, it has an economic risks and business has to have to address their objectives has operational resiliency and supply chain and third party risk, has IT security risks. Um, as a result of the remote office environment, we're seeing increased harassment risks where um, you know, before people were in the corporate environment pretty much knew how to behave, even though some still did not, and we have the Me Too focus and everything else. Uh, but you know, for general, most employees knew how to behave in the, in the home office, uh, in the corporate environment. Now they're working from home and things are a little more lax at home and they're a little more freer with their tongues. And, and things are being said in, in messaging and Zoom calls and things like that because people aren't in their same corporate office environment. So they have increased risk of harassment because of COVID-19. And we have increased risk of modern slavery uh, because uh, the, those factories over in remote parts of the world, you know, they're being devastated by the virus as well. And, and employees are sick or dying. And as a result, you know, some of these factories are staffing, you know, child labor and forced labor, which increases our modern slavery risk. You have uh, increased risk of fraud because uh, organizations, you know, the employees, I'm sorry, the employees are concerned about providing for their family. Uh, and uh, good employees that under normal good circumstances wouldn't do bad things under extreme economic pressure to provide for their family and what their future might look like, they're more, you know, likely to commit fraud. We have increased risk of bribery and corruption uh, because all of a sudden now, you know, shipping and, uh, and, and supply chains are being restricted and it takes more time to get things through customs. And there's more risk that somebody in the business is going to pay that government official a bribe to expedite their goods through customs to get things through quicker because we're all dealing with less staff and it takes more time to, to get things moving around the world right now. 
and there, there, there's less planes flying. And, and so there's increased risk of bribery and corruption. Uh, and, and we can go on and on and on about all these interconnected risks. But what's the challenge in a lot of organizations is they manage all these risks in separate silos. Uh, and and they, 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 even when we've had enterprise risk management programs, um, I have been blogging on this for years, uh, that you know, our enterprise and operational risk management programs are overly captivated on IT security. I am not saying that IT security is not a big risk. IT security is a huge risk. It's a significant risk in the organization and we need to address it, but it's not the only risk. And I look at a lot of ERM and ORM programs and they seem to be overly focused, you know, like 90% of the risk exposures IT security. And that is just not balanced. I wrote a blog just a few months ago, December, 2019. And the blog article was, you know, we have a tale of two futures, taking a little spin off uh, Charles Dickens, a tale of two cities. You know, we have a tale of two futures. Is our future a Blade Runner future or a Star Trek future? The decisions we make on environmental and health and safety and things like that right now indicate our future, you know, and, and in that context, you know, health and safety issues like pandemics, as well as environmental issues and climate change, you know, I called out in there and that too many ERM programs. And when you look at Gartner and Forrester, you know, and you look at their, their waves and magic quadrants, it seems like enterprise risk is all about IT security and IT security is a significant risk and should be part of it. But these organizations are completely missing like environmental and health and safety and other risks. And all these are becoming are critically important to include in our enterprise risk management program. And I think a lot of organizations are starting to finally wake up to that. We have a more balanced view of what enterprise risk is to the organization. Um, so in that context, and I think we're going to see a greater focus on operational resiliency, which is this, this integrated approach to bringing business continuity and operational risk together. And now the, the FCA and PRA and Bank of England are leading the world in operation resiliency regulation. Uh, but you know, coming out of this, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see operation resiliency type requirements go across industries and around the world uh, as a result of this pandemic. But we need this integrated approach that sees the big picture of risk across risks, has strong scenario planning and being able to be able to monitor and manage and understand and, and go through tabletop exercises to be able to respond to global risks here. You know, I've written that this current pandemic is not a black swan, you know, and, and, and to me, uh, those individuals that are calling it a black swan are in a CYA exercise, a cover your behind, you know, type exercise. Uh, and, and, and because they look bad with their board directors that they haven't been, didn't have this risk on the radar. But we've been warned about this. We, we, we've, we've had pandemics, you know, I, I'm, I, I love history. And so, um, uh, you know, you, I'm particularly medieval history. You can talk about all the, the plagues in the, in, in, in the Middle Ages, but we had the, the Spanish flu from a hundred years ago. You know, uh, we had a, a virus pandemic just 10 years ago. And I remember being in San Francisco and going through tabletop exercises and scenarios through, across many different organizations working collaboratively. How would we respond to a pandemic? Uh, uh, should it rise again uh, of a, even a greater scale? You know, we've had Bill Gates and even George W. Bush tell us about that we need pandemic preparedness. It's been on the World Economic Forum, you know, top risks for years on, on their chart, along with environmental risks and climate change and other things. It's been discussed at Davos and, and other things. This is not a, a risk that it was not foreseen that is a black swan. This is was foreseen, but the fact is people were unprepared for it. It wasn't on their radar. <laughs>